Okay, good uh, morning, everyone. Such a joy to be here with you and share with you from God's precious word, uh, the Bible. And I'd like, if you would, if you've got Bibles handy, uh, to turn with me to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we've been looking at messages about the Gospel from the Gospels. And we've looked in Luke and John, and we're going to be back in Luke this morning and John after lunch. So we're back, we're kind of bouncing forth between Luke and John. But I'd like us to read from Luke 23. Luke 23, and I'm going to just read from uh, verse uh, 32, and I will read down to verse 46. So not too lengthy a reading, uh, but very, very important part of the Word of God, the Bible. So it begins this way, and there were also two other malefactors, or we might say criminals, led with him to be put to death. <laughs> And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. God, again, will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. So what we want to think about this morning, it might seem a kind of a bit of a morbid subject. But I want to talk about hope in the face of death. And it's a subject we don't like to talk about. It's one of those unmentionables. You know, you can talk about almost anything, but don't talk about death. And part of the reason is, well, we, we don't want to face the reality of our mortality. That all of us, one of us in this room will be the next one to go. Death is the ultimate statistic. One in one dies. And so we don't like to think about it, but one day we have to face it. It's going to happen. And so it'd be good if we were ready for it. And if we had a sure hope in the face of death. And it is interesting. People die differently. Uh, I was just uh, amongst a group of uh, people in North Carolina, and they're what's sometimes called First Nations or Native Americans. And uh, there's uh, been a great work of God amongst them, and there are many of them that are believers in the Lord Jesus. But they all said the same thing about their uh, fellow tribes people who don't know Jesus. And they said... When you're at their deathbed, they all say the same thing. My feet are on fire. Interesting, isn't it? See, that's just the beginning. Joseph Stalin, you might have heard of him. Remember that? He was that communist dictator. His daughter was there when he died. She said that he was absolutely in terror as he faced his last moments. Interesting. On the other hand, you have people like Dale Moody who said, if this is death, death is glorious. Wow, what a difference. And in fact, Dale Moody said, one day you're going to hear that Dale Moody has died 
said, don't believe a word of it. I'll be more alive than I've ever been. Amen. What a difference. So the question is, how are you going to die? You're going to die in terror? Or are you going to die confidently with hope? So we want to look at these two individuals, uh, the two malefactors or criminals who were crucified either side of the Lord Jesus, Jesus being the one in the middle. And we want to think about these two individuals because it's interesting that, in a sense, we have something in common with them because they're facing death and we're going to face it one day. And yet what's interesting is what determined the destiny of these two individuals is how they responded to the one in the middle, the Lord Jesus. One of them uh, is assured that that very day he would be in paradise. Wow, what, a, what an assurance. I, I, I suspect he died a happy man. The other one had no assurance. And so really it comes down to that. What will you do with the one in the middle, Jesus Christ? Because that's what determines a person's destiny, where they will spend eternity. What have they done with the Savior of sinners. You see, if you reject the only Savior of sinners, then there's no salvation for you, because there only is one Savior. You can't save yourself. He's the only Savior. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, no one comes to the Father but by me. And so if you don't come by him, there's no other way to come. And so he's the only one. And this idea of death is, you know, it's kind of, again, you probably said, Mike, you're so pessimistic, you saw all the rest of it. But I just wanted you to be ready. You see, Jesus said the guy who was the biggest fool in the Bible is a guy who was laying up much goods for many years, and then suddenly he died. And the law says, you fool. This night your soul will be required of you. And who's who's going to get all those that stuff you've accumulated? You can't take it with you. There'll be no U-Haul at the back of the hearse. You came into this world naked. You're going out of it naked. And, and so, basically, what are you doing with Jesus is the most important thing. And so, the Bible says this, it's appointed unto men once to die, and then the judgment. Interesting. Once to die. And so, again, we just want to think about this, because, uh, you see, we often think, well, you might be looking around the room, and you see some older people, you say, well... Yeah, you said one of them is going to be next to go. I've got a suspicion it might be this one. Let me tell you, I've been to funerals of every age imaginable. Death doesn't have any respecter of persons or ages. I've been to people who were wealthy and people who were poor. All kinds of people. And so, as we look at these two men, I want to just try to learn from them. The first one, we just want to break in verse 39 here. Uh, these two, uh, it says it in Matthew's gospel, they were two thieves. So uh, that was their criminal behavior. But it says one of the, the malefactors, one of these criminals which were hanged, railed on him. I am speaking insultingly to Jesus and saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. And so he reflects a lot of people in this world who, who say, well, if you're really real, Get me out of this mess and I'll take you seriously. It's kind of like what they call the foxhole prayers. Have you ever heard of those? You know, it, they say there's no atheists in a war. When you're in the middle of a battle, before you're going out of the trenches to face the enemy, a lot of the people in those foxholes will say, God, get me through this battle. And if you get me through, then I'll take you seriously. And they survive the battle. And guess what? They forget all their that's the way the human heart is, isn't it? I'll, uh, uh, Lord, get me out of this mess and I'll take you seriously. Why don't you respond to him when you're not in the mess? When he's done so much for you. I mean, the goodness of God is supposed to lead you to repentance. He's, he's so good to you in so many ways. Uh, why wait till you get in a fix before you call out to him? But that's often what people do and then they don't keep their side of the bargain. And so this man... He's just self-centered. Get me out of this mess. I'll take you seriously. In other words, I'm not going to take you seriously unless you get me out of this mess. 
There's no sense of guilt to what got him into the mess in the first place. It wasn't God's fault that he was a criminal. It was his fault. It was his responsibility. He didn't want to take any responsibility. He's saying, just get me out of this mess and then I'll take you seriously. And then he has no respect for the person of Christ at all. He speaks insultingly. He railed on the Lord Jesus. You know, one of the hardest things I find, I hate it when I hear people curse using the name of Jesus. But it happens all the time. They speak insultingly. And the amazing thing is that when they die, the very person they're going to appear before in judgment is Jesus. All judgment has been given to the Son. <laughs> Everybody has to face Jesus. You know, it's really much better if you face him today and just get real and honest and trust in him as your Savior than to have to face him as your judge. But one way or another, you're going to face him. That's just the way it is. And so it's interesting. So he, he rails on him. He saved yourself and us. And notice uh, the second criminal now comes into the equation in verse 40. It says, but the other answering rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you're in the same condemnation? And you'd think that a man who is dying, if he hasn't feared God before now, he might get serious and fear God. But it's obvious this one, on the one side, is not in fear of God. And, and e even the other criminal can see it. And he says, don't you fear God? And that's the problem today, that people don't fear God. And that's a tragedy. Because you should fear him, because you want to stand before him. And he's your ultimate judge in the person of Jesus Christ. You should have that proper fear of God. So he says, do you not fear God? Now, what's interesting, uh, I want to just look at another gospel. Just keep your finger there and look at Mark chapter 15 and verse 32. And you're going to see something interesting because he hasn't always been this way. In fact, in Mark's gospel 15 verse 32, it says this, uh, let Christ, the king of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe and it says, and they that were crucified with him reviled him. So that's interesting. That There was a time when both of them were speaking insultingly of the Lord Jesus. But now one of them has had a, an amazing change of heart and change of mind. In, in fact, uh, he's now rebuking his friend for doing the thing that he was just doing a few minutes ago. What changed his mind? And by the way, the Bible has a, a very special word that describes changing your mind called repentance. And, and so how did this man repent of his former rebuking and, and abusing the Lord Jesus to come now and say, don't you fear God? In between. Well, I think... It was to do with what he heard from the lips of Jesus on the cross. Because in chapter 23, and we read it in verse 34, it says, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I, I suspect this criminal had never, ever seen anything like this before. And the reason he'd never seen anything like this before is that usually when somebody is innocent, and they are arrested, and then taken to prison, and then they're beaten, you know, blindfolded and beaten, and, and people, they're mocking him, saying, you know, tell us who did this to you, and, and then they take him, and they, uh, they nail him to a cross, and they hoist him up, and they let him down in a hole in the ground, so the very joints are pulled out uh, of his body, and, and, and all of that, and he's done nothing wrong. Usually, what's the response of somebody that's being treated like that. Usually they're cursing the people who have carried out this terrible injustice. Usually they're, they're so mad at these people who have done this to them when they had done nothing wrong. And yet from the very lips of the Savior come these amazing words. Father, forgive them. 
they don't know what they're doing. Wow, that's staggering, isn't it? And so as a result of hearing this, I suspect that this other criminal is thinking, what kind of man is this? Like we're, in fact, he goes on, doesn't he? He says here, do you not fear God seeing you are in the same condemnation and we indeed justly, we deserve to be hanging on a cross because we have done wrong. We have been criminals, we've been thieves, but and we receive the due reward of our deeds. But he says, but this man hath done nothing amiss. So he knows Jesus is innocent and yet he has been punished. And so there's a, there's a massive change in the mind of this man. And he begins to fear God because he begins to think, I've never seen any man respond like this. Maybe he is the Messiah after all. Maybe he is the one who he claims to be. And if he is, I better, uh, better change my mind about this and deal with him differently. And so he... he there is this massive change of mind. And of course, our goal this week is to change your mind about the Lord Jesus. Because there is nobody else like him. Amen. And that's why we're doing this. Is we, we want people to fall in love with Jesus Christ. That's what we want. That's, why, that's what this is all about. Because there's nobody, there's nobody that would be treated as badly as he was. And then say to those who were doing it. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Nobody would respond. He's absolutely unique. And so he says, we're in the same condemnation. We indeed justly, we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. He recognizes his guilt. He's saying, I deserve what I'm getting. And by the way, you'll never, ever come to Christ until you acknowledge your guilt. That's the prerequisite. You've got to come to that place where you realize you deserve judgment. You're a hell-deserving sinner. You, over your lifetime, have accumulated enough guilt to convict you in the court of heaven. Every one of us in this room, from the youngest to the oldest, an accumulation of guilt, rebellion against God. You're doing what we know to be wrong. Uh, even our conscience is telling us wrong. We do it anyway. And so we've got this accumulated, and we, we know, we, and we, but it's the hardest thing in the world to come to that place where you acknowledge your guilt before God. But it's necessary. I, I, I never forget the night where just the re reality of the weight of my guilt as a sinner came home to my heart. And I remember saying, not out loud, but just in my heart. God, you would be perfectly just to send me to hell. And I knew he would. And that's, you got to get there. He also recognized, as we've said here, that not only was he worthy of this condemnation, he and his fellow criminal, worthy of the judgment, we're getting what we deserve, the due reward of our deeds, but as we said, he also recognized this man has done nothing amiss. Jesus has done nothing wrong. And of course, everybody's of the same opinion about Jesus. It's kind of interesting. Uh, Pontius Pilate, the man who judged him, says, I can find no fault in him. He washes his hands. He, he said, uh, he, he, he recognizes that he's condemning somebody who's innocent. <coughs> Amazing. I can find no fault in him. Judas, he, he, he says, I've betrayed innocent blood. Peter, you know, it's interesting that the people that know us the best, that, that are closest to us, that have been with us the more time than anybody else. Like, if you want to really know what I am, you ask my wife, she'll tell you. Okay? She knows better than anybody else. All my frailties, all my failings, all my faults. She knows them. I don't ask her because she'd be embarrassed to tell you. <laughs> and you don't have enough time anyway. To here. But here's Peter who spent three years with the Lord Jesus, morning, noon, and night. He's examined him closely. And he says this, 1 Peter 2.22, about Jesus. He committed no sin, neither was guile ever found in his mouth. that amazing? You see, it's our speech that gives us away, really, isn't it? And yet he says, 
There was never any deceit ever came out of his mouth. He always told the truth. What a state. You see, see, this is the, the, the issue that, that Christ was innocent. So why did he die? Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And I, I said, we're all going to die someday. And the reason we're all going to die is because we're all sinners. The, the soul that sins, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible says. And that's what the world tells us through the evidence. Well, why do you think cremation is so popular? They're running out of space in the graveyards. Death is the ultimate statistic. People are dying all around us. And so here's a person who has never sinned. And yet, he's hanging on a cross and he's about to give up the ghost. We read that. He's going to dismiss his spirit. So why did Jesus die if he never sinned, if the wages of sin is death? Well, it's simple. I'm just going to read your scriptures. Because scripture is not going to convince you. It's not my anything I say. It's scripture that convinces people of the truth. But it says this, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, we've quoted this numerous times this weekend. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. Isaiah 53, 6, the Lord has laid upon him... So God the Father has laid on him, God the Son, the iniquity of us all. First Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. And so the idea is simply this, that Jesus, who knew no sin, but he came to be the sin bearer, to bear your sin and my sin on the cross. So that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. It's the most amazing transaction. He says, I'll take your sin and I'll give to you the righteousness of God if you'll simply trust me. Now, you'll never get a better offer or a better opportunity than this. To have all your sin taken from you and have all God's righteousness put to your account. There's no better thing than that. But you have to come through Jesus Christ. You have to come to him. Acknowledge, like this man did, you're a guilty sinner. And you, you're, if you're going to have any hope for eternity, it's through Jesus Christ. I want you to notice, I want you to just think about what, what it must be like, by the way, for Jesus to have the sin of us all placed upon him because he was so holy. I had a friend, he was a Welshman, I know it's unusual for an Englishman to have a friend who's a Welshman, but I had a friend who's a Welshman. And this uh, this man went to a very expensive uh, school in England, and a very posh school. And uh, one of the things that they would do to the new boys is that there was a there was a, a school canteen, and they used to scrape all the slops into this uh, this big trough. And once a week, a local farmer would come and get it and then feed it to the pigs. And so what they would do with the new boys is they would put them and they would baptize them in the trough. I want you to imagine that, you know, just for a minute, all the old baked beans. I mean, this is English food, you know, so there's baked beans and there's Marmite and there's custard and all these English things all heaped on the person. Can you imagine how vile that would feel? Now, here's the spotless son of God. Never even had a negative thought in his life. And all the vile, wicked sin of the world is placed on him, including yours. And he's punished as if he did it all. See, that's, that's what Jesus did in Calvary's cross for you. So, we want to just review this man's progress. He developed a fear of God. He is real. He is there. He has to be faced. He sees his own sin and guilt. We're getting what we deserve, he says. He sees Christ as the innocent one. Dying for sinners. 
And now the next step. He wants the Lord to help him in his desperate state. And this is what he says. And it's, it's amazing, just simple words. But he says in verse 42, he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. It's an awful lot in that statement, really. First of all, he's acknowledging who Jesus is. He says, you're Lord. And then he's saying this, Lord, unless you remember me, when you come into your kingdom, I don't have a hope of being there unless you would remember me. And then he says, I know that you're a king and that you're going into a kingdom. And so we've got to come to that place where we realize that our only hope for where we will spend eternity is through Jesus Christ. And that somehow we have to recognize as a guilty sinner, my hope for eternity is that somehow the Lord Jesus, in his love for me, bore my sin on that cruel cross. And I believe that. And my hope for eternity is him and him alone. And it's really interesting. I remember for myself, I just uh, so guilty, so conscious, so convinced of myself being a sinner. I realized that that, that if I, I, I kind of felt like if I died in my sleep, I'd wake up in hell. I was so sure of my guilt. And I remember just kneeling down at the side of my bed and thanking Jesus for dying on that cross for a wretch like me. In that night, an amazing thing happened. Peace of God, which passes all understanding, flooded this troubled heart. And I knew that if I were to die, I would immediately be in the presence of Christ. Not because I was a good person, because I had a great Savior. Amen. And he is a great Savior. He's a mighty Savior. And he wants to save you. He does. And so notice the Savior's response to this man. He says, verse 43, Jesus said unto him, verily. That word verily is a great word. It's from which, it comes from the Latin word veritas. But we use it all the time. We talk about, you've got to verify it. You've got to make sure, you know, so it means it's, it's got to be shown to be true. You, you need verification, you know. So, so, so when Jesus says verily, he's saying, this is the certified truth. You can take this to the bank. Isn't that amazing? Verily, what, what makes it so certified, so certain? He says, I say unto thee. You see, we, we already said, no deceit ever came out of his mouth. So if he says, I say unto you, you can go to the bank with that. It's true. It's going to happen. If he says it, because he'll never deceive anybody. So he says to this man, this is verifiable because I'm saying it. And then he says this. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Wow. What hope in the face of death. This very day, you are going to be with me in paradise. Now, paradise, it literally means a garden of delights. I don't know what, what it's going to be like, but I know it's going to be. Everything God ever did was beautiful. It's going to be amazing, isn't it? You're going to be with me in this garden. And what makes that garden of, garden of delight so delightful is we'll be with him. Yeah. Because he'll be the most delightful thing in the garden is going to be this lovely person, the Lord Jesus. And so his promise to this criminal is that this very day you will be with me in paradise. Now here's a man who now has hope in the face of death. That's real hope, isn't it? Amen. So I want to just, I want to go to another scripture now, just for a minute, and we'll, we'll be done soon, because we're, the message is clear, I think. We don't need to prolong it, make it overly lengthy. But I want you to notice in Ephesians 2, and verse 8 and 9, it says, For by grace... Are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of any man should boast. 
This is one of the most important verses in the Bible on salvation. And as we, we, we apply this verse to this man's experience, well, let's think about grace. He says it's by grace, you say. Grace means undeserved, unmerited favor. So I want to ask you, did that criminal deserve to be in paradise? What did he deserve? Same that we deserve, right? Hell. But it's by grace and grace alone that he will be with Christ in paradise. Because it's by grace that people are saved. Nobody gets there because they deserve it. They don't deserve it. He says it's through faith. It's obviously, it says not of works. They're kind of the opposite of each other anyway. Through faith, not of works. Because if salvation was by good works, this guy up to now, all he's done is bad works. He's a criminal on the cross and admitted his guilt. So if salvation is by good works, there's not a hope for this man. And it's too late to do them now because he's nailed to a cross. He can't do any. It, 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 you see, salvation by works doesn't work. Salvation by faith through grace works. And so it, it, it's not of works. It's not by sacraments. Some people say you have to be baptized to be saved. This guy didn't get baptized. He didn't get baptized. He's nailed to a cross. He never took communion. He didn't do any of the sacraments. And yet, this day, you'll be with me in paradise. Notice there's no purgatory. I grew up in a system that said, well, you know, kind of if you're if you're better than other people, then you, you know, you have still have to go to purgatory and you have to have your sins purged. And it might take you, you know, thousands of years. Jesus says today, Amen. you'll be with me in paradise. You see, it, it, Hebrews 1 3 says this when he had by himself, that's Jesus Christ, purged our sins. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty of God. You see, the, the only person that can purge your sins is Jesus. We can't purge them in purgatory or anywhere else. There's no plea bargaining. He couldn't say, Lord, <laughs> I'll turn over a new leaf. You know, I'll do this for you. I'll do that for you. He's nailed to a cross. He can't, he can't offer to do anything. There's no limits to God's grace. It reaches a hardened criminal. In his last moments. And there's no time like the present. For him, time was running out. So for him, now was the accepted time, right? If he doesn't do it now, it's too late. He's going to die. And it's too late. But it's true for us too. You see, now is the accepted time for you. Because you're, you cannot guarantee your next breath. So now is the time to make sure that you are right with God. <clears throat> I want to suggest to you that these two thieves that we've been considering, in a sense, they reflect this room. See, there's two possible responses to the message that you're hearing about Jesus Christ one is to side with the one thief, thief who scoffed and mocked. Kind of siding with the crowd. Because that's the majority opinion. The other one is to be like the second thief. Who in his desperation cried out, Lord have mercy. Save me. <laughs> that's the, they're the two responses. So the question is. What's your response? See, one thief, as the result of his decision, is in paradise. The other is in torment to this very hour. One thief was saved so that nobody needs to despair. But somebody might be thinking, well, I'm going to go and sow my wild oats first. And then on my deathbed, I'll get saved. Well, the problem is only one of the two responded. See, what happens is the more you saw your wild oats, the more hardened your heart becomes and the more difficult it would be to turn in that day. That's why it's good to do it now. Now is the time. 
And so I want to encourage you, just realize, just think of that picture again, the Lord Jesus having all of your sin put on him. And then him, the innocent one, never, never a wrong thought, bearing it in those three hours of darkness and bearing God's judgment upon him as if he had done it so that you could go free, but you have to make a decision about it. You have to, like this man, say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. There's got to be a personal response. There's got to be a, you know, it's like, a, you know, you could see what I'm telling you, a cure that will give you hope in the face of death. Imagine you found out there was a cure for cancer. And it, it, it was guaranteed to work. And you've got that cancer. Knowing all about the cure won't do you one bit of good until you actually take the medicine. Then it'll do you some good. And there are people who possibly could die knowing all about, maybe they even read the, the fine print that comes with medications. They read everything, and yet they didn't take it. But they died. We're giving you some wonderful medicine this morning that can save your soul for all eternity. But you have to take it. <laughs> you have to say, Lord, save me. I want to be saved. I want you to be my savior. I want you to save me now. Turn from this wicked life. I don't want to live like that anymore. I want you to change me forever. And if you do that, just simply by believing on him, you can be saved. Right where you sit. Forever. And you can have certain hope in the face of death. Something you're going to face anyway. Much better to face it with a certain hope, isn't it? You know, I have to say, I'm not concerned about dying. Because from what I read in Scripture, to die and be with Christ is far better I suspect, you see, it says in his presence, there is fullness of joy. So like Mr. Moody, one day you're going to hear that my cat was dying. Don't believe a word of it. I'll be more alive than I've ever been. But that can be your experience too. Or you could experience your feet on fire. That's just the beginning. Let's pray. Father, we just pray. <laughs> You know each person here and where they stand before you. You know which thief they most reflect. Maybe they're mocking, scoffing the very thoughts that are being conveyed this morning. On the other hand, there might be one who is beginning to wake up to the reality of their own mortality and the urgency of doing something about it and coming to the only one who can give immortality through the gospel, a life without end, a life without any corruption, a life that will last you our whole eternity with the Lord Jesus in a garden of delights and with a person who is delightful. Oh Lord, we pray that that would be the case, that they would trust the Lord Jesus as their savior and those of us that are saved lord we pray that we would be so overwhelmed with gratitude that it would be written all over our faces we ask it in the name of the lord jesus christ amen amen, amen. anybody else